Hello and welcome. I'm Rosanna Lockwood. You're watching W News, broadcasting live from the Al Arabiya headquarters. These are our top stories. After days of cross-border attacks between Israel and Hezbollah, a deadly Israeli airstrike hits the southern Beirut suburbs. Reports members of Hezbollah's command unit were killed in the strike, including the organization's number two and head of special forces, Ibrahim Akil. And Israel's military claims more Hezbollah commanders were killed in the attack. A statement from the organization is expected shortly. Welcome. Well, we do begin in the Lebanese capital, where there was a loud explosion this afternoon in the city's southern suburbs. A strike on an area of Beirut that is known to be a Hezbollah stronghold, with the Israeli military saying it carried out what it called a targeted strike in that area. Well, for more on this, I'm joined now by Beirut-based journalist Hannah McCarthy. Hannah, uh, a lot happening there in Beirut today. What do we know so far about this strike? There's actually a lot of conflicting reports and statements coming out about who was targeted and how many were killed. Sure. So um, the Ministry of Health has released a statement saying nine people have been killed uh, and... and nearly 60 injured, and we understand there are children uh, among that number, although that is still being confirmed. Um, and again, we also understand that Ibrahim Akhil was killed in this uh, strike. Uh, and we understand that uh, from initial reports, it's that uh, he was injured in the pager attack earlier this week, and he left hospital this morning. Uh, and it looks like a major security um uh, uh, kind of mess up for him to have um, got, been discharged from hospital uh, and then gone to a, what seems like a meeting with other uh, Hezbollah commanders. Uh, and again, we're kind of relying more on the uh, Israeli military statements about the details for this. Hezbollah haven't released a statement yet. So again, we're kind of relying a bit more on, on these Israeli reports of what happened. So we do need more detail from Hezbollah. It, They've suggested that a whole cadre uh, of Hezbollah commanders may have been killed in this, uh, but they haven't confirmed yet. Uh, and again, the, they haven't officially confirmed that Ibrahim uh, Akhil, who basically take, took over from Fawad Shakur, uh, who was assassinated at the end of July uh, in southern uh, Beirut in a similar style attack. Yeah, and indeed, uh, Ibrahim Akhil had a $7 million bounty on his head. Uh, what else can you tell us about him and why he was such a target for Israel? Sure. So Ibrahim Akhil, um, the, that bounty was actually only placed uh, on his head uh, last April uh, by the U.S. government. So they were particularly keen uh, for information about his whereabouts uh, because of his involvement uh, in the attacks in the 80s uh, on the U.S. embassy uh, and the U.S. Uh, Marine barracks, where uh, over 240 uh, Marines were killed. So uh, it kind of, it's a, it's a huge. Uh, event in uh, American military history. It's one of the biggest losses of life for them, I think, in one day. Uh, so he did represent um, a significant target for the U.S. The U.S. has said they had no advanced warning of this operation. Obviously, there was some uh, suggestion online that, you know, given the value of uh, Akhil to uh, the U.S. Uh, government, that maybe there was U.S. intelligence or maybe there was more coordination uh, than uh, they're letting on. Again, more details still coming out about that. And, uh, you know, let's talk about the destruction to the neighbourhood, a residential neighbourhood in southern Beirut, Israel's military claiming that this was targeted. However, as you mentioned at the start there, uh, potentially anywhere upwards of 60 people injured, maybe nine people killed again, still waiting full confirmation and details of that. But the video is showing quite serious destruct destruction to this neighbourhood. Sure. Uh, so uh, the IDF immediately uh, put out a press announcement that they had conducted a targeted strike uh, in Beirut, uh, unlike with the pager attacks earlier this week, where they never took responsibility publicly, at least. Um, and I, I think it's important to distinguish uh, this type of attack from maybe the attack that we saw earlier in the year um, in Beirut, which took out uh, a Hamas commander. And we saw kind of from footage of that attack that uh, it was a target very much um, focused on one room in a building. I mean, if you see the pictures, it's it's basically just, you know, one room has been taken out of the building. Whereas in this case, uh, it looks like two buildings have been leveled. Uh, it's a very substantial attack. And I think uh, it's a very expansive interpretation of the word targeted to suggest this was targeted, um, you know, 
lots of it was a busy kind of civilian area uh, there was uh, people passing by in the street you know, there was domestic workers from Ethiopia who described having to um get them out of get themselves out of buildings you know that were uh, full of rubble uh, so again this was uh, a, a target uh, that has had a destructive effect on a civilian neighborhood Look, it's been a very dramatic uh, week in Lebanon, in Beirut and other, across other parts of Lebanon as well. How much more are you braced for, you being there in Beirut this weekend? How much are people talking about what might be to come? Uh, I mean, I think everyone's just very much alert at the moment. Uh, uh, I mean, there's question marks, you know, how, how will funerals be conducted uh, for uh, the Hezbollah members who've been killed today? Uh, we've already had uh, detonations at the funerals of Hezbollah uh, members who were killed in the pager attacks. Um, there's going to be a real heightened sense of paranoia uh, about any public gathering, I think, at the moment. And I think what this attack does is it underscores that this, the pager attacks and the, uh, and the walkie-talkie attacks, th these have... A, and these are an intelligence breach and a security breach that will ripple for weeks to come. Uh, and I think what we've seen is because so many Hezbollah members, you know, were brought to hospitals uh, and medical centres, that there was a there was a huge intelligence gathering opportunity uh, for the Israelis, uh, and they seem to have put it to use today. Uh, again, we don't have final. Con confirmation of that, but it certainly seems like uh, the pager attacks. Uh, ha um, created an opportunity uh, for Israel to track uh, senior Hezbollah uh, targets that they had not been able to successfully target before. Beirut-based journalist Hannah McCarthy speaking to us from there this evening. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, let's uh, dive deeper into the foreign policy ramifications of this for countries everywhere, but of course with Israel and Lebanon right in front of us. And speak to Lebanese-American foreign policy specialist and former advisor to Donald Trump and Mitt Romney, Walid Faris. Sir, thank you for making time. Um, let's begin with the latest thank details you. from this strike on Beirut this afternoon. If indeed Hezbollah's Ibrahim Akil was killed in this strike, as uh, Israel is claiming, how important is this? Every strike the Israelis are conducting, and every time they score uh, a strike against a high-ranking official, I mean, that started with the two waves that we've seen of the explosives, but from there on, it looks like that they are targeting the whole hierarchy, the whole combat hierarchy, not the politicians at this, uh, this point, it is, is important for the Israelis. But on the long run, the question is, uh, even if the Israelis crumble that one structure would it not be replaced with time? So eventually what Israel is gaining is a long time, a long time enough for them to actually close the dossier in, in Gaza. And I would add one thing, probably the, the American election. So that's what the strategy of the Israelis seems to be. So you think this was all coordinated? I mean, there was arguments earlier in the week that the Israelis were forced to act sooner on their coordinated explosion device uh, attack, uh, if indeed it was them behind it, because they haven't claimed official responsibility yet. But the pager explosions, the walkie-talkie explosions, and now we're talking about this attack, uh, supposedly killing Ibrahim Akil and on the command structure of Hezbollah. Do you think this was all uh, conceived of and composed to happen at this time, and you're saying in the lead-up to the US election? Look, these are analyses that we are um, advancing because the military and intelligence groups in uh, within the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force and others, they present a plan. They actually present a strategy for their leadership. So that they have done it over the past six months. We realize now even older than that. They have always had plans in engaging with, uh, with Hezbollah. Hezbollah does the same. They have plans to reach Haifa and Tel Aviv and et cetera. The only difference is that at the highest level, that would be the war cabinet and the prime minister, they decide on the timing. Now, certainly we're going to hear stories, right and left reports. Some may be true, some may be not, that they, have, they had to rush. They had to rush because Hezbollah's counterintelligence was about to know. We don't know that. But what we know is that there are two very important benchmarks. After the U.S. elections, they're going to be a change, most likely. Uh, that change depends on which administration is going to be formed. And the Israelis have to, if they have to rush, it will be because of that uh, reason, not, not just because Hezbollah was about to discover.
Look, there, uh, Mr. Farris, there's, there's been arguments today that what Israel is doing currently in Lebanon, what it did today uh, regarding Beirut and then, of course, the cross-border strikes as well, it's trying to decouple what's happening between what it's doing in Gaza and what it's doing with Lebanon. Do you agree with that argument? Yeah, there are a lot of arguments, analytical arguments, but if you look at it from a geopolitical perspective, they are delaying. They are actually not catching time quickly. Demands of ceasefire, and because there is a more than a light pressure by the Biden administration. That's why I would link it actually to what is the U.S. position. If the U.S. position would have been, let's say, under Trump, given an example, then the Israelis would have had more green light on Gaza to finish quickly or to take action in, in a different way. The same with regard to Hezbollah. So it looks logically that the Israeli gov uh, government wants to deter Hezbollah as they are progressing against Hamas. Do we call it decoupling? Maybe on the political media level, but it, it seems to me it's well coordinated within, within the decision-making ranks inside Israel. OK, well, let's, as you've uh, described there, the U.S. involvement in this or the role that they could play from afar. Let's talk about Western intervention, what can be done to help de-escalate the situation. UN Security Council uh, meeting later on today. I mean, can that have any impact? Unfortunately, my answer is no. Mm. The UN Security Council is already divided on another war. Mm. That's why Russia and China will have the veto power. You know, they can discuss with the U.S., but what they're going to discuss is also... What do we do in Ukraine? And most likely before the elections, I am not sure that we're going to see a, a serious, uh, you know, Security Council resolution under Chapter 7 that would impose solutions. We may get statements by the Security Council. We may get a resolution on humanitarian matters, but it is a little bit late in the game. I think even the Security Council will have to, the forces of the Security Council will have to wait for our elections here. What about U.S. funding to Israel? There's also an argument that um, the great deal of funding, the huge amount of funding that the U.S. gives to Israel has actually somehow deterred a greater escalation of the situation because it gives the U.S. leverage in negotiating or mediating the situation and trying to restrain Israel. Do you buy that? Well, I kind of rent that, not buy it in the sense that mm -hmm. those tools would have been more efficient, uh, let's say, after October 7 and the months after October 7. But once we got into our election season, mm -hmm. I mean, both sides, both campaigns are claiming that they are supporting Israel all the way. Obviously, Donald Trump support all the way and, and can claim that Mr. Netanyahu is a friend and ally. They worked together for four years. But at the same time, uh, you know, the, the Kemala campaign is also claiming that they will provide Israel with all what they want. So at this point in time, it's an Israel time as we're getting closer to the elections. But I am pretty sure, depending on who's going to be in the White House, policies are going to be very different. I mean, if it's Trump, you're going to get the same alliance and support that uh, he had provided Israel in his four years. If it's uh, Kamala, uh, what's going to happen is a more pressure on Israel and a different resolution uh, with regard to the United States, meaning two-state solution and, of course, a rigid ceasefire. That would be the policy for the next four years. Let's refocus about what's happening right now in Lebanon. Uh, what are the chances, you think, that we might actually see Israeli ground invasion into Lebanon, a meaningful ground invasion? Actually, if we listened carefully to the speech of Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, a couple of days ago. That's what he was focusing on. Actually, that would be to the advantage of Hezbollah, their ideal situation, if Israel tries to move in. Because they believe that with the current topography of South Lebanon, with the weapons they have, I mean, they lost a lot of cadre, but they didn't lose yet reserves or, uh, or big weapons that they have. or Remember that Hezbollah has an open path, open corridor, some would call it highway through Syria and Iraq into Iran, and supplies could come. Now, if Israel wants to invade Lebanon or a piece of Lebanon, I think that would involve a, a larger decision. That one will have to integrate the United States, because logistically, Israel will need a support by the United States if, if it's really fighting on two fronts. If their military are inside Gaza and now inside Lebanon, that's not an easy matter. It's certainly not. Do you think Israel is able to continue fighting on those both fronts? 
Israel has the logistics that would allow it to do what it is doing right now, meaning little progress on the ground in Gaza until Rafah is gone. That's their strategic vision. And what would happen there is then Israel and the U.S. and two to three Arab countries will have to meet and decide on a security plan. That's the vision. In southern Lebanon, there is no security plan. There is a de facto plan. So if Israel at one point, not now, at one point decide to move in and establish a safe zone, security zone, what's going to happen is that the lines of engagement are going to just go north. So wh wherever Hezbollah will withdraw to, because Hezbollah may need to withdraw if this campaign of uh, Israel's action against its uh, structure continues. So, so we, may, we may see a withdrawal by Hezbollah, but its guerrilla will stay in. That's why I call it a long war. Look, uh, you mentioned that word war. In terms of uh, Lebanon being at war, you know, short of it being officially called that, is it essentially in de facto war now? First of all, I may have not pronounced it well, a long war. This is going to be a long war, not necessarily a world war. Uh, but time is going to depend on, again, and keep going back to that matter, what policy is going to be in Washington, but also in Europe. There are changes that are happening in Europe one way or another. It's going to be linked to the, the big negotiations between the next administration and Russia. So it's really more or less in, intertwined with this, but on the ground. The conclusion that many among us analysts believe is going to be the one, if Israel cannot change the geopolitics of Lebanon, and they tried in 1982, it was very difficult, and there was a withdrawal after that. We don't know if the Israelis have in mind to change the actual system, meaning to isolate Hezbollah inside Lebanon, profiting from the fact that some of the Arab countries, you know, are on the other side, and the Syrian opposition, maybe Saudis, UAE, we don't know at this point in time. But that's a big architecture. That's a big architecture to change the position of Hezbollah. Or if Tehran decides to a ceasefire, unilateral ceasefire on the South Lebanon front without really demanding the same for Gaza, that's also another possibility. Interesting. Uh, look, it's been really good speaking to you, foreign policy specialist, former advisor to Donald Trump and Mitt Romney, Walid Faris. Well, Mr. Farah's there bringing up the role that the U.S. plays in all of this. To go into that a bit deeper, let's now bring in former Middle East negotiator and advisor to the U.S. State Department, Aaron David Miller. So good to speak to you, too. Um, look, I want to start with a piece that was published in The Washington Post today containing comments from you um, that were particularly interesting. You put forward a theory that Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu approved of this week's exploding device attacks, if indeed Israel uh, were behind it, they haven't claimed responsibility yet, um, as an operation to boost his own political fortunes. Talk to us more about that. Well, I'm basing this on a yet-to-be-confirmed uh, analysis on why the Israelis acted when they did. It's clear why they decided to, uh, to penetrate uh, Hezbollah's comms both with pagers and walkie-talkies, uh, that was presumably intended to be a prelude to a major military operation, which would have knocked out not only his, his ball, wounded Hezbollah operatives, but knocked out their capacity to, to communicate with one another. But there is no major Israeli military ground campaign. At least there hasn't been one yet, and they've now lost the element of surprise. So the question remained, why did they seek to activate these devices now? And one working theory is that Hezbollah and or Iran were on the cusp of discovering um, what the Israelis had done. Uh, another theory is that Mr. Netanyahu, uh, that it was not the case, and Mr. Netanyahu, in an effort to boost his political uh, fortunes, uh, pushed <clears throat> the intelligence organizations to go ahead and do this. So we don't know. All, I'm, all I suggested was that most everything Benjamin Netanyahu has done over the course of the last 11 months is driven and tethered to one overriding objective, which is to maintain himself in power. I, I'm trial for bribery. This is no great secret, nor is it uh, crude, cheap politics. He's on trial for bribery, fraud, and breach of trust in a Jerusalem district court, now four years running. He's due to testify, maybe he'll testify, in December if he loses power. If he cannot create a coalition that will sustain him in power, he faces one of two choices. One, a possible conviction, and Aaron Omer went to prison 
mm. for only one of the former prime minister, only one of the charges that Mr. Netanyahu was uh, accused of, or cut a plea deal which drives him out of politics. So that, that was my only point in making that. I, I have no idea, nor does anyone else, mm. except Israelis, why they decided to detonate these devices. Mm. I mean, you, you talk there of a, a wider coordinated military strategy that maybe uh, Israel were forced to act early and they didn't get the chance. Short of a ground invasion, though, we have seen a strike on the southern uh, Beirut suburb this afternoon, uh, supposedly reportedly from an F-35 jet, um, taking out the Israelis, say, a senior Hezbollah commander. Is this part of right. their military strategy? Are they actually acting this out now? It's just not with the ground troops. Well, not, I mean, that's like saying Switzerland would be a different country if it weren't for the Alps. <laughs> I mean, the reality is that the, gr the ground troops are the decisive turning point or inflection point in any Israeli military operation, certainly one in, in southern Lebanon. They haven't been involved in any serious ground campaign in the north since the summer of 2006, and that operation did not go very well. No, I think this is still part of Israel's campaign. The assassination of Fouad Shukr on July 30th, they didn't claim responsibility for killing Ismail Haniyeh by a remote-controlled detonated device in Tehran on July 31st. This is part and parcel of their campaign to target Hezbollah's senior officials and uh, and commanders. Whether this is uh, going to presage, a, again, a major military operation is yet to be seen. I, I made the point, and I think it, it's sadly true, that we are witnessing three wars of attrition, mm -hmm. one between Israel and Hamas, one between Israel and Hezbollah, and one between Israel and, and Iran. There is no diplomatic end state for either of these. The best you're going to be able to do is to deter, contain, and maybe, maybe, through a set of transactional arrangements, for example, what Amos Hochstein, the U.S. mediator, is proposing, which, frankly, would be a diplomatic off-ramp for his bullet should they choose to take it. But I think it's very problematic um, because it doesn't involve Gaza, number one. And number two, you know, the israeli Hezbollah conflict is not the same as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm -hmm. There you have border security, Jerusalem, refugees, the, the core permanent status issues, which are legitimate and need to be resolved. Here, you have an organization in Lebanon whose existence, literally, whose physical and political existence is tied mm. not to the establishment of Israeli-Lebanese relationships, but its legitimacy is tied with its defense of Lebanese interests. And Mr. Hoxstein negotiated the maritime border a year or two ago with the acquiescence of Iran and Hezbollah. And there are a dozen points on the land border that uh, if you actually did use the diplomatic off-ramp, uh, off many of those points would be resolved in Lebanon's favor. My concern is that Hezbollah has no intention and no interest. You cannot satisfy Hezbollah's requirements because that would undermine their mandate as a proxy of Iran and as a defender of, the, of Lebanese national interests. And that's clearly not doing the Lebanese people much good. Look, while we've got you, it would be certainly remiss, and certainly given, given everything that's happening and the situation in Lebanon and with Israel fighting on both fronts at the moment, if not three fronts, as you described there, not to talk about Gaza and efforts towards a ceasefire plan. Just a few weeks ago, U.S. officials saying they presented a take-it-or-leave-it plan proposal to Israel and Hamas, or they wanted to, regards uh, Gaza, but nothing seemed to come of that. Why was that? It's because the two principal decision makers, the only two people who count, sadly, in terms of finding a way to alleviate the misery to the two plus million people of Gaza, free the hostages, bring some solace to their families, living and dead. The two principal decision makers, Yahya Sinwar on one hand and Benjamin Netanyahu on the other, simply have concluded that not making a deal is much better suited to their interests than actually concluding. And based on my experience in Arab-Israeli negotiations, they succeed only when the parties are in a hurry. And there's no urgency here, I'm afraid, on the part of Netanyahu or Sinwar. Understandably, the one party that is in a hurry is the Biden administration. It's fascinating speaking to you. Thank you for making time for us. Former Middle East negotiator and advisor to the U.S. State Department, Aaron David Miller. Thank you for having me.
Well, as the situation between Israel and Lebanon continues to escalate, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump has been speaking to crowds at the Israeli-American Council summit where participants were remembering the events of October 7th. The former U.S. president appealing for more votes and pledging to get all hostages freed by Hamas from Gaza if he gets back into power, saying he believes the upcoming U.S. election is critical to Israel because if his opponent Kamala Harris becomes president, it'll be the end of the country. Carolyn Malone reports from Washington. Well, a busy Thursday night of events here at the Israeli-American Council Summit, during which we heard from a former hostage, a hostage that was held by Hamas in Israel. We heard from family members of uh, people who were either killed in some of the Hamas attacks or those who still have family members being held hostage in Gaza. Um, at the highlight of events on Thursday night was a speech by Donald Trump, the former U.S. president. In that speech, he very much appealed to the Americans and the audience to vote for him in the upcoming presidential election, saying that if he gets into power, then Israel has you know, a strong friend at the top of the White House. But if his competitor, Kamala Harris, gets into power, then uh, people that vote for her are foolish because it would pretty much spell the end for Israel as far as he sees it. Um, he gave some references to his previous time in office. He spoke of some of the agreements and deals that he made, including the Abraham Accords. You know, overall, though, it's been quite a somber event here, and certainly um, people have been remembering October the 7th. Of course, that's nearly a year ago now when the Hamas attack on Israel led to Israel's retaliation and has led to a huge amount of civilian deaths, particularly in Gaza, with real concern now over this escalation. Overall, the U.S. is among those countries trying to have a diplomatic deal, trying to have an agreement, a ceasefire deal, the release of hostages, and that's something that Trump said if he gets back into power, he will make sure happens. He didn't, he didn't give specifics on how that would happen, but he said that's one of his pledges. Certainly, though, with this increase in tension and escalation and violence that we're seeing in the region, it is looking increasingly difficult for the U.S. to even move forward and push forward and help all sides try to come to kind, any kind of negotiation or deal. Certainly, though, for the people at this summit, uh, they very much want to see an end to the fighting so that these hostages can be released. Caroline Malone, Al Arabia News, Washington. Now let us have a look at some other international news from the day. Qatar Airways, the latest airline to impose restrictions in response to the current conflict between Israel and Hezbollah, banning pages and walkie-talkies on board all flights departing Beirut until further notice after a series of coordinated explosions earlier in the week. Russia's defense ministry saying it destroyed three Ukrainian drones over Kursk and Belgorod last night in what it's calling a terror attack. Both sides increasingly using drones as a means of attack on each other, with footage earlier this week showing a large fireball and smoke from a Russian ammunitions depot allegedly struck by a drone. At least one elderly woman killed and two others wounded by Russian strikes in Ukraine's Zaporizhia region. The governor calling alleged Russian forces bombing the area 161 times in 23 hours, targeting infrastructure and residential buildings. Ukraine's President Zelensky, meanwhile, scheduled for a U.S. visit next week to address the U.N. Security Council. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump saying he will probably meet him, despite previously describing U.S. aid to the country as a waste of money. Staying with this story, Europe spent sending $39 billion in loans to Ukraine to help it get through attacks this winter. Commission President Ursula von der Leyen announcing this on a trip to Kiev, part of a wider plan to raise funds from frozen Russian assets. And to some business news now. General Motors recalling more than 440,000 pickup trucks and SUVs in the US due to issues of brake fluid. Highway officials saying a warning light might not show when there's a loss. A fluid GM promising to update software free of charge. And another recall, this time for Mercedes-Benz and its Chinese joint venture with Bake Motor. Recalling over half a million imported and China manufactured vehicles after China's regulator found issues with the wheel speed sensor in hot and humid environments. Embattled plane maker Boeing temporarily furloughing tens of thousands of white collar employees. 
This amid strikes by around 30,000 workers, which have halted production of some of their best-selling aircraft. And a plant at the heart of the worst nuclear accident in, accident in American history set to restart operations in a deal to sell power to Microsoft. Three Mile Island, as it's known, involved in plans for a 20-year deal that will restart the Unit 1 reactor. Well, let's get a recap of our top stories tonight. A deadly Israeli airstrike hits the southern suburbs of Beirut after days of cross-border attacks between Israel and Hezbollah. Hezbollah saying it's number two and head of special forces Ibrahim Akil killed in the strikes. The group expected to make a statement tonight following claims by the Israeli military that more Hezbollah commanders were killed in the attack. That is all we have time for. Coming up next is Riz Khan. And at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, join Tom Burgess-Watson from Global News Today with special guest, the former Prime Minister of Lebanon, Fouad Signore.